What does the term network neutrality mean? A good definition is posted on the website of the man who first coined the term net neutrality, Tim Wu, a law professor at Columbia Law School in New York. Let me quote at length from a page at timwu.org, which is devoted to defining the term. Tim Wu writes, quote, Network neutrality is best defined as a network design principle. The idea is that a maximally useful public information network aspires to treat all content, sites, and platforms equally. This allows the network to carry every form of information and support every kind of application. The principle suggests that information networks are often more valuable when they are less specialized, when they are a platform for multiple uses, present and future. Note that this doesn't suggest every network has to be neutral to be useful. Discriminatory private networks can be extremely useful for other purposes. What the principle suggests is that there is such a thing as a neutral public network, which has a particular value that depends on its neutral nature. A useful way to understand this principle is to look at other networks, like the electric grid, which are implicitly built on a neutrality theory. The general purpose and neutral nature of the electric grid is one of the things that make it extremely useful. The electric grid does not care if you plug in a toaster, an iron, or a computer. Consequently, it has survived and supported giant waves of innovation in the appliance market. The electric grid that worked for the radios of the 1930s works for the flat screen TVs of today. For that reason, the electric grid is a model of a neutral innovation driving network. The theory behind the network neutrality principle, which the internet sometimes gets close to, is that a neutral network should be expected to deliver the most to a nation and the world economically by serving as an innovation platform, and socially by facilitating the widest variety of interactions between people. The internet isn't perfect, but it aspires for neutrality in its original design. Its decentralized and mostly neutral nature may account for its success as an economic engine and as a source for folk cult of folk culture." Unquote. Sounds great, right? A maximally useful public information network that aspires to treat all content, sites, and platforms equally. Sounds like something everyone would support, right? So if everyone would support it then, and this brings us to our second question, why is net neutrality necessary? It's necessary because net neutrality, as great as it sounds, is not universally supported. There are powerful entities that want to undo this maximally useful public information network to change it to something over which they can gain exclusive control and exclusive profit. These powerful entities in particular are large scale telephone and cable television providers, which have had a history of vertical integration with internet service providers and consolidation among themselves, where buyouts, mergers, and attrition result in fewer and fewer providers holding more and more of the market. In the phone market of the, of the United States, we are down at the time of recording these lectures in June 2014 to just four, er, to just four major providers, Verizon, AT&T, Sprint, and T-Mobile, who combined command 90% of the telephony market in the United States. In the cable market in the United States, four firms, Comcast, Time Warner Cable, Cox, and Charter, combined to command 62% of the cable television industry's revenue. And that concentration is worse when you look at it from the perspective of individual consumers. I mentioned that there are a handful of cable TV and telephone companies holding most of the market share. But 20% of American households have just one internet service provider. And of the 80, remaining 80%, 80 more than 96% of those remaining 80% have at most two providers, a monopoly cable TV provider or a monopoly telephone provider. This concentration affects, or potentially affects, the, the internet and network neutrality in the following way. If an internet service provider in a more diverse market would not behave in a neutral fashion, that is, if an internet service provider would, for example, start to slow down or block outright unaffiliated content or access to content, unless folks paid more for that content, if that were to happen, then an unsatisfied consumer in a diverse market would simply switch to a different internet service provider that didn't behave so badly. 
But in a monopoly or in a duopoly where parties behave like mobsters and make switching to another provider difficult or impossible, then the internet service provider has that leverage and can use it to fleece customers or degrade content or worse. Net neutrality, then, is a matter of bringing a measure of public accountability to these private shakedown artists. We, as a society, are largely unable or unwilling to take on these monopolies or duopolies. The concentrations of power and the expected consequences of markets, about which we will discuss in greater depth in a later lecture. But those private tyrannies are, in the case of the internet, nonetheless performing a public service. Historically, when that happens, when something private fulfills a public good, that falls under a practice, a practice and set of rules referred to as common carriage, with such parties being common carriers and net neutrality being an extension of that tradition of law and practice pertaining to the internet. There are and have been claims by some people, often officials who are affiliated with the Republican Party, who claim and have claimed that, a network, that network neutrality is just additional bureaucratic red tape, a solution looking for a problem. For example, Federal Communications Commissioner Michael O'Reilly says that net neutrality in any form is, quote, unnecessary and defective, unquote, and doubts that, quote, there, there is an actual problem resulting in real harm to consumers, unquote. In actuality, there have been a number of cases of violations that can be construed as violations of neutrality on the Internet, and that can illustrate specifically what could come to happen if net neutrality were to end. Before we dive into specific examples of network neutrality violations, it would be useful to note what forms such might violations might take. Again, Tim Wu, the gentleman who coined the term network neutrality, offers a list of four potential violations of network neutrality, which we'll describe brief briefly. Violation number one, blocking. And that service providers simply block anyone or anything they don't like. Violation number two, what's called termination monopoly pricing. Another way of saying that internet service providers can charge excessive fees to content producers or content consumers who wish to gain access to users. Violation number three, what's called playing favorites, also called most favored network violations. This is where internet service providers don't block, but instead prioritize applications and content which they like, and deprioritize that which they don't. And violation number four, transparency failures. This is when internet service providers don't say everything that they know to content providers and content to consumers, not just about the service options of what's available, but also about details of the state of the internet at any particular time. So, Commissioner O'Reilly says that net neutrality advocates fail to make the case that there is an actual problem resulting in real harm to consumers. It turns out that there are, already, on the record, instances of internet service providers who have already kicked the network neutrality hornet's nest in each of these four violation examples. Let's go through them again in turn. Violation number one, blocking. There are a number of instances in which internet service providers have been caught blocking content. In 2007, Verizon declined a request from Narrow Pro-Choice America to carry text messages. And AT&T muted some politically charged lyrics during a live stream of the musical group Pearl Jam at Lollapalooza. In both instances, AT&T and Verizon backtracked on those actions and addressed concerns voiced by Pearl Jam and Narrow. But nevertheless, blocking did happen. And that highlights the very real concern of potential abuse should net neutrality be abolished. Violation number two, termination monopoly pricing. In December 2013, Comcast began to throttle internet traffic generated by the streaming video service Netflix. Traffic improved after Netflix and Comcast in February 2014 agreed to a, quote, mutually beneficial interconnection agreement, unquote, even though, quote, terms of the agreement are not being disclosed, unquote. Indeed, there's a se video segment on the HBO TV series Last Week Tonight with John Oliver, where they track the throttling, throttling of traffic of that Netflix deal with Comcast and demonstrate the connection between the two. What's more, reports have since floated that a deal between Netflix and Verizon resulted in no noticeable speed improvement for Netflix customers using Verizon. Violation number three, playing favorites. 
In 2007, Comcast was caught deprioritizing content that used the internet protocol BitTorrent, a set of digital rules, a protocol, that's particularly useful for transferring very large files across the internet. BitTorrent is enormously popular and widely used. It accounts, by some estimates, for as much as a third of all internet traffic. BitTorrent is widely used for movie and TV show sharing, what's sometimes called content piracy. And Comcast got caught in selectively interfering with BitTorrent downloads by Comcast customers. But Comcast was not caught by the FCC or by rival companies, but by investigators aligned with outsiders, most notably the nonprofit groups Public Knowledge and the Electronic Freedom Foundation. Comcast didn't make what they did readily apparent, which also makes it an example of violation number four, transparency failures. The violation was discovered after the fact. Another example of such a transparency failure is the degrading or blocking of voice over IP calls across mobile telephone networks. Such transparency failures are often explained away as measures to address security concerns. So we see a definition of what net neutrality is, we have a description of ways it's violated, and we have concrete examples of ways in which it has been violated. So let's assume the worst case scenario. Suppose that the provisions regarding network neutrality on the internet are abolished, and that the big internet service providers, particularly the big phone and big cable TV companies, have free reign to carry out the violations we outlined. What then? What would the end result look like? What's most likely to happen? Internet service providers in the United States would now be able to legally to block, gouge producers and consumers, play favorites, and not be transparent in revealing the details of their actions. Presumably, given the profile the issue has gotten, those internet service providers would, as a concession, maintain a policy of neutrality, perhaps for a number of years, until the issue itself would presumably die down over time. Comcast, for example, has agreed to abide by net neutrality uh, policies until 2018 as a concession to their buyout of NBC Universal. But after that, net neutrality, barring no other changes, will be formally ended. The policy fights will have been concluded, the policy will now be in place, the legal recourses in the courts will have been exhausted, and organized money will have defeated organized people regarding internet policy with no going back. ISPs have ended their concession to abide by net neutrality, or they will have done so, and they will begin acting in their interests. They'll begin to increase their costs for usage and for providing content. And those costs are being applied more widely. Only the wealthiest producers can maintain their access uh, to content, while users will have their content options reduced markedly. There are graphics online that envision what this would look like, taking the form of mock advertisements. For example, in one such mock ad from the fictional company Telco ADSL, you get starting internet access at, 20, at $29.95 per month, accompanied by the very legal small print known as mouse type, which says, includes 500 megabytes of free transfers to non-peering websites at full speed, limited to 120 kilobits per second thereafter. In other words, you can have access for a limited amount and then the internet would only be available at extremely slow speeds. The ad imagines a variety of optional tiers for things like international news, domestic news, music, online gaming, online retailers, and social networks. Each of these tiers carries an additional price of $5 to $10 per month. Mind you, by current Chicago standards, even these imagined inflated prices would be lower than what we currently pay. So let's increase the cost to say, $200 per month for basic access with tiers at $25 to $50 per tier per month. And these sites or resources by activists, nonprofits, and small scale companies, which are not in these commercially approved bundles, would be counted against your download quota, would be available but only at exceedingly slow speeds or perhaps blocked entirely. And if there would be no way to address these problems. If this sounds eerily like the current arrangement of cable television, it's not a coincidence. Cable TV providers also rank among the major internet service providers. Providers, Telephone providers are also getting into the act with their own clones of cable television, like Verizon's Fios and AT&T's Uverse. What's more, with their bundles of cable television channels available in these subscription platforms, 
What you get now with cable television eerily resembles what is envisioned with the internet later, if net neutrality is abolished. There are serious policy reasons why now we are in a now or never situation regarding the internet. These are tied into the history of the internet with key implications to future policy and future crafting of how the internet works. We'll explore that history and how it ties into a key FCC vote in 2014 in our next lecture. Hello and welcome to lecture two, the four lecture series on net neutrality. In the first of this series of four lectures on net neutrality, we address some fundamental questions about the design principle and practice known most popularly as net neutrality, what it means, why it's important, how it could be violated, and what's apt to happen if it were to be abolished. The issue of net neutrality has gained increasing attention across the public with points of high public interest that correlate to key points in the fight over net neutrality going back at least the last few years. But it was on May 15th, 2014, that the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, by a three to two commission vote, approved to proceed, approved to proceed on a docket, now formally known as Proceeding 14-28, that would mark the commission's third attempt in seven years at formalizing net neutrality. The previous two attempts were challenged in court by internet service providers and were both defeated. The level of commentary and discussion, and discussion for the net neutrality issue has now reached levels unmatched for any issue open, open for public comment in the history of the FCC going back to the commission's founding in 1934. In this lecture, we'll explore the reasons why this has grown to be such an issue now the reasons which are critically tied to the history of net neutrality and the U.S. government policy and litigation back and forth. One useful framework for understanding this is a critical distinction in communications law dating to the Communications Act of 1934 that, among other things, led to the formulation of the FCC. The 1934 Act includes a number of categories of media for which different policies apply. These categories of media are called titles, and for our discussion about net neutrality, the focus is on the first two of these titles. There's Title I, what's called an information service, and Title II, what's called a telecommunication service. Well, let's illustrate with some concrete examples. Indeed, we've already seen and you already know these examples. An example of Title I media is cable television, a business pure and simple, where the provider can largely call the shots. The provider has great leverage in deciding what channels are available, for what price, and you as a consumer are basically given the option to accept the terms or leave or go without or find another provider if one exists. And as mentioned in the first lecture, for the vast number of Americans, there is no competitive choice on cable, in the cable television market. That's Title I, Information Service. An example of Title II, Telecommunication Service, is a telephone a provider of what's long been touted as universal service. The idea being, you have a telephone and can call anyone else who also has a telephone, with the telephone network allowing you to make your call while providing a strong degree of reliability without degrading your service or increasing or decreasing call quality if you pay more or less. As a result, a great majority of American society has had telephone and telephone access. To be fair, I am drawing broad strokes here. Cable television, which falls under the pro-business Title I classification, does have public service provisions, like the establishment and maintenance of public access television channels. Meanwhile, the U.S. telephone industry has had a long, sordid history of its own, monopoly control, smashing competitors, stifling innovation. But for the purposes of discussing net neutrality, this is the distinction that's particularly useful for the analysis to follow and it also demonstrates what's at stake with the FCC's vote on net neutrality in 2014. In the previous lecture, we discussed the term net neutrality and the definition proposed by the man who coined the term, law professor Tim Wu. In brief, net neutrality is a network design principle which fosters a maximally useful public information network that aspires to treat all content, sites, and platforms equally. From the earliest days of the Internet in the late 1960s, until 2002, 
That principle of equal treatment was the governing policy for the Internet in the United States. So what changed in 2002? In that year, the Federal Communications Commission carried out a little-known decision that seriously wounded net neutrality. The FCC in 2002, by a 3-to-1 party-line vote that got barely any media coverage, the FCC voted to reclassify cable modems from their Title II status of universal service and public access to Title I, controlled by business for business. This would mean that the internet, which increasingly was being offered as a service by cable companies, was now theoretically on the same legal standing as cable television, with all the blatant money-grubbing and poor quality we've come to expect from most cable TV. The chair of the FCC at the time was Michael Powell, probably best known as the son of former General and Secretary of State Colin Powell. But back in 2002, the same year that the Powell-led FCC made a little-known reclassification decision, Tim Wu wrote an academic paper entitled Network Neutrality, Broadband Discrimination, which coined the term that would gain widespread usage for the policy of non-discrimination on the Internet. The FCC's decision to reclassify cable modems was challenged when a small Internet service provider from California with the less-than-imaginative name Brand X wanted to use cable connections owned by the cable providers to provide Internet service. But they could not because of that 2002 reclassification. Brand X then sued the FCC, and the suit worked its way all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court, when the Supreme Court ruled in a mixed 6-3 decision in 2005 that a affirm the FCC's decision to reclassify cable modems as a business rather than as a public service. That decision affirmed the FCC's right. Indeed, in, in the FCC in 2005 would go on to also reclassify telephone modems in addition to cable modems from Title II to Title I, also along party line votes. But those decisions as encouraging as the Internet Service Cartel found them, did not lock those decisions into a permanent state. They could be reclassified back. And the fight was now on in Congress. In 2006, the main effort from the corporate ISPs came in the form of the Communications Opportunity Promotion and Enhancement Bill of 2006, abbreviated the COPE Act. The COPE Act had only lukewarm protections for network neutrality and net neutrality advocates regarded the bill as a step backward for free speech and opportunity with the Internet. The legislative fight over the COPE Act in 2006 marked a, the first full-throated fight over net neutrality. The COPE Act passed the U.S. House, with Illinois' own first district representative, Bobby Rush, serving as co-sponsor. Indeed, he was the first sponsor from the Democratic Party on the bill, in fact. But it was in the Senate when the efforts for the COPE Act derailed. Comparable legislation actually passed out of committee in the Senate, with a Republican Senate at the time, and with a Republican Senate at the time, the COPE Act's Senate equivalent probably would have passed. But shortly after the Senate committee hearing on the bill ended, the bill's main shepherd, the late Alaska Senator Ted Stevens, opened his mouth. Stevens was recorded decrying net neutrality advocates but the effect was instead to demonstrate his own profound ignorance of how the Internet actually functions, famously describing the Internet as a series of tubes. That expression wound up gain, gaining widespread popularity and became an embarrassment to the bill. It was never brought to a vote in the Senate, and the COPE Act as a result died from inaction, thus helping the net neutrality cause. But the struggle continued with the FCC as the main form of action. Michael Powell had left the FCC in 2005 to join the very industry he supposedly regulated. By the way, he currently stands as president of the biggest cable TV lobby in the United States. Powell's successor as FCC chair was Kevin Martin, another one of the commissioners to vote for Title I pro-business reclassification of cable modems. Kevin Martin approved action to support net neutrality, though given that the actions fell under a pro-business framework, that made it vulnerable to subsequent court challenges by the big internet service providers. Nevertheless, a challenge to net neutrality was brought to the Commission's attention. Indeed, it's one we saw in our first lecture, the throttling of BitTorrent traffic by Comcast. The FCC fielded the complaint and ruled against Comcast. 
Comcast instead opted to sue the FCC in response in the hopes of defeating the commission's net neutrality regulations. Mission accomplished. In 2010, in the case Comcast versus FCC, the FCC's net neutrality regulations were struck down. By now, Kevin Martin himself also left the FCC to take his chances on the job market. He is now a consultant with Patton Boggs, a high-powered DC lobbying firm. The Republicans who had carved anti-net neutrality policies for most of the decade between 2000 and 2008 were now out of majority at the FCC. Barack Obama, who on the campaign trail had claimed himself an enormous supporter of net neutrality, was now president. Indeed, as president-elect, he said, quote, I will take a backseat to no one in my commitment to network neutrality, unquote. So with him being in the White House, there would now be a Democratic Party majority at the FCC. Obama's appointee as FCC chair was Julius Ganachowski, an investor, internet business entrepreneur, and media attorney. Ganachowski echoed Obama's concern with net neutrality and had a Democratic Party majority to work with. But he was nonetheless swayed by the corporate involvement in media policy. In the summer of 2010, Google and Verizon had struck a net neutrality policy deal, which would grant net neutrality for landline communications, but do without it for wireless communications. That matters greatly for the future of the internet, because the future of the internet is increasingly moving to wireless, and moving to mobile, and away from landline and the web. The other Democratic commissioners at the FCC joined Genachowski in approving the policy. They felt that, imperfect as it was, some net neutrality policy is better than none and that at least with a policy in place, steps could be taken over time to improve it. So, in December 2010, the FCC along party lines voted into effect a net neutrality policy. All this time, the internet remained in Title I business, pro-business classification, leaving it vulnerable to attack in the courts, with no reconsideration of a reclassification back, back mentioned. Sure enough, a lawsuit against the FCC was filed shortly after they took action. This time, Verizon, who had been a party to crafting the policy that the FCC approved, was now suing the FCC to undo their own lukewarm version of net neutrality. And in January 2014, the FCC lost in court. Their extant net neutrality policy struck down. The First Circuit Court in Washington, D.C., which heard the case Verizon versus FCC, did affirm the FCC's right to regulate in the interests of net neutrality, but not to do so as a Title I pro-business information service. By then, Julius Genachowski himself also left the FCC for greener pastures. He is now a part of the notorious high-powered investment firm, the Carlyle Group. And in 2013, President Obama appointed as FCC chair Tom Wheeler, a former telecom and cable lobbyist. In the wake of the FCC's court loss to Verizon, Wheeler wound up crafting a policy that was the worst of all worlds, essentially recycling the failed policy that had been agreed to by Google and Verizon, and allowing for the establishment of what was so-called paid prioritization among internet service providers, leaving the classification of the internet into the Title I pro-business black hole. Where the FCC is ostensibly serving as a public watchdog, the actual policy is, like much of the FCC's history, that of a corporate lapdog. Meanwhile, during all this time, concentration among commercial internet service providers had decreased. Small-scale ISPs were dying like fl flies in the wintertime, reducing by 50% during the years from 2000 to 2010, and more than 90% of the wireless internet market is held by just four companies with more than 60% held by just two companies, Verizon and AT&T. There are, to be sure, various initiatives to try to bring some alternative against the bondage of the incumbent internet service cartel, things like gigabit internet initiatives, community internet efforts, including those underway presently in Chicago, and even large corporate non-ISP efforts along the lines of Google Fiber. Whether or not those efforts succeed remains to be seen. But one thing is certain, if the legal standing of the internet gets changed, you can bet that the actual practice of the internet, or what most people think of as the internet, will also change. The big ISPs even admitted as such. For example, 
Ed Whitaker, the former CEO of AT&T, in an interview with Business Week magazine in 2005, said that users and producers on the internet, quote, would like to use my pipes for free, but I ain't going to let them do that, unquote. To be sure, the picture I've painted in this lecture has not been encouraging, with public policy facing loss after loss, big corporations having a disproportionate influence on policy, and those who craft the policy jumping ship to join the very industry at play. But the policy I've told here represents just one portion of the history of internet policy over the past decade and change. There is another story to tell, one which has been very encouraging and which represents our best hope for the future. There has been in the past decade a resurgence of media activism and public involvement in media policy, the likes of which America has not seen in a generation. It has a number of achievements to its credit, and among those achievements is a dramatic win amid the crafting of the FCC's net neutrality provisions in 2014. The popular outrage fueling it that won the classification of the internet from P P Title II pro-public telecommunications service to a Title I pro-corporate information service. The overwhelming public outcry over the FCC's policy proposal in barely a month's time forced onto the table the reclassification of the internet back from pro-corporate to pro-public that in the way that net neutrality so desperately needs. The response forced a massive freakout from the corporate ISPs who have taken to arms the policy fight to come in 2014. Of course, the popular efforts that won that battle are not perfect. They have their flaws and their weaknesses, but they also have tremendous strengths and the potential to grow and mature. We will discuss that popular movement and their st story in the history of recent internet policy in the next lecture. And the Electronic Freedom Foundation, into that end, confirmed that fact. That confirmation and the evidence for that formed the basis of a complaint that Public Knowledge and the um, EFF and others filed before the FCC. And the FCC heard the complaint, registered it on the docket, and took action to their credit. They actually fined the FCC. Um, the FCC, they, excuse me, they fined Comcast. Comcast, in response, rather than acknowledge what their course of wrongdoing um, and pay the fine, which probably was nominal, I think in the ballpark of like $7,000, nonetheless decided to sue the FCC saying, you don't have standing to, to, to take this action against us. And that court action resolved itself over this cup that went two, three years. 2010, Comcast won. The FCC was found not to have the standing to carry out the action that they did. And so their, their, their net neutrality policy was struck down. And that was, you know, that's, that's the one of the series of these you know, cycles of action that we've seen. Yes? Is that because, like you said, they were rescheduled as a Title I? So are you saying that they don't have any standing as of now to regulate any type of net neutrality? Is that the case? Or? The question is regarding uh, standing, regarding the classification of the Internet from the Title I pro-business to the Title II pro-public arrangement. And the answer is exactly yes. The reason, as the court has acknowledged, that the FCC is trying to have it both ways is because of this inconsistency. The internet, both cable modems and now telephone modems, are classified under a Title I pro-business regime. And any regulation to try to enforce net neutrality flies in the face of that regime. The solution, though, is very simple, and in fact is on the table, as I had mentioned. We undo that classification of both cable and internet uh, telephone modems, probably the whole internet, into a different regime. You could probably get it passed tomorrow if you can convince a majority of commissioners to do that. I, I would bet you that at least two commissioners would be on board. The third one is, I am happy to report, um, capable of being educated. And that is our job, to do what we can to educate literally one person we were able to achieve that, I think we can probably win that fight. We'll see what happens in 2014. But, yeah? But as of now, there's really no net neutrality provisions that are enforceable by law? The, the question is, are there any net neutrality provisions enforceable by law? At the level of the FCC, that is correct. There are none. The FCC is currently ham-tied when it comes to net neutrality provisions. Any action, that, well, actually, strictly speaking, they can't take any action because they have no policy in play. 
That's what actually was approved on May 15, 2014, regarding um, their current take on net neutrality. They have to craft a policy for actions that they would, at least in theory, want to be able to take. So that's what's going on now. This is their, at least in the last seven years, their third go around at crafting those rules. But now, what is now different and very encouraging is that, that now that classification back to Title II is on the table. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. How frequently is the uh, violations occurring? Um, that is a good question, and I'm not quite sure about the full scale about this. Um, it, and we may not know, again, for the reasons about transparency on these issues. In order to be able to know everything about that, we would have to have um, direct insight into the entire state of their internet and the access of what they were able to provide for internet access. So you'd have to know what's going through their pipes, so to speak, what actions are they taking or not taking, what are the reasons for that, can those reasons be justified, or are they basically the digital equivalent of a shakedown for more money? So the answer is, it could be a lot. Unfortunately, being able to get at the scope of that is not something that we have information on, and that's also something that we should fight for in, in the, a net neutrality provision that hopefully can pass muster. To that question, how, how, I, we wouldn't really find out about it unless we knew people personally that were having trouble, um, or if they brought it to court, right? Yeah. How would we know such information? And yes, that is exactly correct. We would have to know, in the case of the original Bitcoin case, we were able to infer this because people online were complaining about their inability to use BitTorrent by being Comcast customers. So that's the tip-off that we got there. But that was one small violate, one comparatively small violation by just one internet service provider, admittedly the biggest one, but nonetheless um, significant, or potentially so. You're right, in order to be able to get a full picture of this, the play, what's play here, you'd have to know the entirety of the internet, the entirety of the state of internet traffic, and what internet service providers are doing at any given time. That's quite a lot of data to have to handle, and plus also, it, it, Verizon, AT&T, Comcast, these big ISPs are very low to want to provide in those details, especially where they're basically providing that pipeline of information. Because they could be providing, this is, this is constant information, a flood of it, that would be taking place. And you'd have to critically analyze all of that, all of the time. That's, that's basically what would have to happen here. What we've seen here are very, as it stands, small, but isolated and verified instances of these violations. We've been able to catch them in the act and these things. But that's really hard to do. I mean, we saw a number of organizations actually verifying this by their own indirect means. And trying to do that on the grand scale to be able to track that out is very hard, just given the nature of the fact that the markets are so concentrated and the people who have that, those, the say regarding the internet service provisions, uh, pr access, are not exactly forthcoming in providing all the details in real time. So, yeah, that, that's part of the challenge here. We would ideally we would ideally demand or provide ways for the public to be able to access this in real time. Will they provide that? Probably not willingly. That would have to be another fight that would have to be taking place. It could be done in concert with this. Mm -hmm. What do you think, because there's no policy in play right now, that they might be playing it safe? The, the cable companies and the internet service providers as far as not to slow anybody's, uh, slow the traffic down in, in instances so that yeah. they can get what they want? The yeah. Community. The question is, are, are the internet service providers playing it safe? Um, I actually get into this in one of the subsequent lectures, but the quick answer is yes. I think they are trying to play it safe. That is, they want to abide by people's expectations regarding a neutral internet for now, mm -hmm. mainly because the, the policy fight is still up in the air. 
and they're, they, you know, they're, they're probably taking it easy. Comcast, at least on paper and in their statements, have said they'll abide by net neutrality through 2018 as a matter of the uh, deals to buy Comcast NBC Universal. That was the agreement that they made. If they could succeed in their buy other Time Warner, they may agree to an extension of that, maybe another two, three years. That's usually how it happens. Most of the time when mergers happen, they're very rarely blocked, but deal, but conditions are put onto it. And one of those conditions include some kind of sunset provisions where you abide by some public service but for a limited time, like maybe two, three, four years, something like that. And this is an example of that. Welcome to the third of these four lectures on net neutrality. In the previous lecture, we examined the policy dimensions of recent history of net neutrality with a particular focus on the years from 2002 onward, extending through various government bodies, the law and the courts, also acknowledging the role that big corporate ISPs and their stranglehold on the American internet market has. But while most of the focus of that discussion on net neutrality is on the legal, policy, and economic back and forth, there's another critical component to the saga that is the focus of this lecture. It's a piece of the puzzle that has been instrumental in keeping the struggle raging for as long as it has. It has not gotten the widespread coverage and analysis it deserves, but its role is nonetheless important and even hopeful. This is the involvement of civil society and the public at large in media policy, particularly on net neutrality. We'll delve into the inspiring history of media policy activism in the last decade and its connections to the net neutrality saga. But first, a word about the struggle of media policy activism. The crux of media policy activism uh, is that largely of building wider awareness. Very often, the policies that big corporations push are hated by the public. But very often, the public doesn't know about those policies until they're enshrined into law and become impossible to dislodge. And even then, the public might not know about these policies. The irony is that the source of information about these policies, the media, have a vested interest in the outcome and are wont to downplay or ignore criticizing or even covering those issues. Activism then becomes a race to inform the wider public and potential allies against the looming danger in order to stop disaster before it happens. The hope is that wider awareness builds outrage that embarrasses the forces of darkness to retreat. We have been fortunate to see that happen a number of times on the net neutrality policy front in the past decade, on the media policy front in the past decade, including a number of times in the net neutrality wars. We will review that history now. In the previous lecture, I mentioned Michael Powell, the former FCC chair turned cable TV lobbyist, who reclassified cable internet modems away from their pro-public stance that they had for much of their history. Around the same time, Powell's FCC, in 2002 and 2003, Michael Powell was also orchestrating a dramatic evisceration of the FCC's media ownership rules. These are the rules that limited media companies, uh, limited for media companies, how many and of what kinds of media they could own in a community and nationally. That matters in that fewer owners with more media made for a worse media environment with more commercialism, less localism, fewer independent voices, and less diverse perspectives. Over the previous decade, media companies increasingly watered down these rules, and Michael Powell sought to escalate the trend dramatically. The business community salivated over the prospect, and the public was all but unaware of what was to come. So activists around the country, and I'm very fortunate to count myself among them, worked to sound the alarm in every way we could, with staging protests, holding hearings, publishing op-eds, and also using the internet itself to spread the word. It worked. The resulting outcry didn't stop the FCC in 2003 from carrying through with a vote of their plan, but the outcry reached an estimated 3 million respondents, far more than the FCC had ever gotten on a single docket. That fueled positive congressional action, even with a right-wing Congress at the time, and was acknowledged as the critical factor in a court ruling that blocked the FCC's action for more than seven years on media ownership concentration, and which cooled down the business community's collective erection. What's the connection of this media ownership fight to net neutrality? There are a number of connections. 
For one, it showed that organizing on media issues is not only possible, but also powerful. Activism on media policy can transcend the usual political divides and can extend across the political spectrum. For another, the internet, the crux regarding net neutrality, is increasingly subsuming the media, with more and more media becoming digitized, and the internet increasingly upending existing media infrastructure and playing more and more of a role in all of our lives. What's more, the media ownership uprising of 2003 taught lessons that were used in subsequent struggles. Net neutrality was one of those fights, which we'll discuss in much greater detail in a moment. But there were also efforts related to the future of the internet, among them the struggle over community internet. A Supreme Court ruling in 2004 in Missouri upheld laws by the state government that forbid local communities in Missouri from setting up their own community internet initiatives. A number of states had faced the brunt of corporate lobbyists and passed legislation in the wake of that ruling to make illegal the establishment of community internet initiatives. But community activists, raising the specter of corporate dominance of local internet connections, rallied to respond back, including blocking those pro-corporate initiatives in Texas, Louisiana, Iowa, West Virginia, Indiana, and Illinois. It was also in the year 2005 that we saw the Supreme, Court's, uh, Supreme Court uphold the FCC's right to reclassify cable internet in the case involving the small-scale internet service provider from California known as Brand X. So the fight was on for the future of the internet. The vehicle for the pro-corporate ISPs, as mentioned in the last lecture, was the Communications Opportunity Promotion and Enhancement Act of 2006, abbreviated the COPE Act. The activism on the COPE Act echoed what we did to combat the FCC's media ownership rules. We wrote about it. We blogged about it. We contacted like-minded allies about it. We organized around it. One series of actions encompassed a day of coordinated national protests against the COPE Act, which were collectively termed the National Day of Outrage and took place on May 24, 2006. Here in Chicago, a protest was held on Congress Parkway outside what used to be the SBC Center. SBC has since got bought out by AT&T. Actually, SBC bought out AT&T and took the name. That protest took place down the street from the Harold Washington Library Center in Chicago. In New York, a rally was held outside the Verizon World Headquarters. In San Francisco, protesters marched on AT&T Park where the San Francisco Giants play baseball. Um, the COPE Act, despite the increasing grassroots activism against it, passed by a considerable margin in the U.S. House. Next, it had to pass the Senate, and its shepherd there was the late Alaska Senator Ted Stevens. We had mentioned that Ted Stevens had shepherded the committee even defeating a net neutrality amendment that failed to be included on the final bill by an 11 to 11 tie vote. But the increasing public interest and public concern in the issue was reflected in the questions that were posed by other senators at that committee hearing. That's when Ted Stevens opened his mouth in response. Here is a partial transcript of his response. Quote, 10 movies streaming across that, that internet and what happens to your own personal internet I just, the other day, got an internet was sent by my staff at 10 o'clock in the morning on Friday. I got it yesterday, happening to be Tuesday. They wanted to deliver vast amounts of information over the internet. And again, the internet is not something that you just dump something on. It's not a big truck. It's a series of tubes. Unquote. That rant would have gone unrecorded had it not been for a single activist with the public interest group Public Knowledge who recorded the audio and posted it online, at which point a blog with the magazine Wired.com reposted the commentary, and the reaction spread swiftly across the series of tubes, even reaching the corporate media, and even getting a segment on The Daily Show, and thereby reaching far wider public awareness. That public, wider public awareness made the bill too re radioactive to bring to a vote. And since it was never brought to a vote in the Senate, the COPE Act died from inaction thus helping the net neutrality cause and keeping net neutrality alive, for now. Consider this, though. Why did senators like Byron Dorgan of North Dakota and Maria Cantwell of Washington go to Ted Stevens into what became a career-defining meltdown? It's because of the activism, large and small, at the time, by those working more and more to make net neutrality an issue. 
The fight over the COPE Act was a bellwether. As is the case with the history of media policy activism, the COPE Act marked a win in the very hardest of fights. The term was in wider discourse, and more people knew about net neutrality and its importance, and the hardest fight of all made it a thinkable issue. That was, and is, critical in any activism, particularly that in media activism. With the COPE Act defeated, the struggle of terrain returned to the FCC to ensure that the cop on the beat stayed true to the principles. To its credit, that's what happened under the FCC Chair Kevin Martin in 2005, who had established the first flawed policy of net neutrality. Consumers who had used the protocol BitTorrent to use and share very large consumer computer files, as was mentioned in the previous lectures, began to complain of slowdowns in use and activity. Activists affiliated with various nonprofit groups, including folks with the Electronic Freedom Foundation, Public Knowledge, and others, hearing of complaints from Comcast customers for using BitTorrent, started tracking Comcast to see if they were meddling with BitTorrent traffic. When evidence was found in that direction, they filed a formal complaint with the FCC. The FCC, to its credit, heeded the formal complaint and took action. But as you'll recall from the previous lecture, Comcast sued the FCC in response in an attempt to strike down the Commission's net neutrality efforts. And given the Com Commission's reclassification of the Internet away into a weaker co pro corporate framework, Comcast succeeded in winning its suit. The milk toast policy efforts on net neutrality continued into the Obama administration, still leaving the reclassification effort off the table. And unsurprisingly, when the FCC voted in 2010 on a second effort at net neutrality, this time with corporate involvement, the FCC lost again in court. Yet in all this time, the buildup among activists continued under the radar for a reclassification of the internet back to the pro-public Title II framework. At least under Title II, activists argued, the FCC stood a far better chance to win in court when it did get sued, as would inevitably be the case. It was on April 23, 2014, that the Wall Street Journal leaked news that the FCC would surrender to the corporate ISPs by allowing what was termed paid prioritization in its net neutrality provisions. The freakout by the public was immediate and massive and encouraging. Within a day's time of the leak, public interest activists got involved in conference calls and starting to chart out subsequent actions. I know, I was invited to those calls. In the subsequent weeks, there were blog posts far and wide. There were activist actions like that announced by one of the co-founders of the website Reddit of buying a net neutrality billboard in the FCC's backyard. There were a host of online videos explaining the policy and its importance. There were multiple net neutrality petitions. There was a round-the-clock encampment outside the FCC in the days leading up to what it was called its Notice for Proposed Rulemaking, the first step in the crafting of any FCC policy. Here in the Chicago area, there was a protest at the FCC's Midwest Bureau on the same day that the FCC would revisit its net neutrality policy. You can even see a documentary video of that protest online. And there was even reporting about the issue across the internet, although as media analysts discovered, there was precious little corporate television coverage of the issue. What else is new? All told, by the time the FCC had held its meeting for its Notice of Proposed Rulemaking on May 15, 2014, the net neutrality docket had fielded an estimated 3.4 million responses. If that's accurate, it would break the FCC's all-time record set by the estimated 3 million responses fielded by the FCC in the media ownership uprising of 2003, a fight that we won, and that we plainly wouldn't have won without that massive outcry. What's more, that's an outcry that took place in the days before the policy process began, whereas the Powell-led FCC in its 2003 media ownership proceeding was doing everything to stay out of public view. Did this make a difference? The full story about this latest battle in the net neutrality wars is yet to be written. But there is one very encouraging development. Title II is back on the table. That is, the FCC, in its final notice that was approved by a 3-2 to two vote, has included a reclassification of the Internet back into its pro-public service framework among the options for consideration. Not long ago, even that would have been considered a distant dream. Now, it's up for consideration. And when word of that development leaked, the corporate ISPs lost their collective minds. 
Within a day, there were opinion pieces and blog posts and letters to the FCC from coalitions of the corporate ISPs and their bought and paid for allies threatening the loss of investment in the internet should the FCC proceed with the reclassification back. So the fight is on now for the internet. But as we've seen in this capsule history, the fight has been on for the better part of a decade and longer. From the original ruling in 2002, to the community internet fights in 2005, to the net neutrality wars of 2006, to the new net neutrality wars take two in 2014. If the debate is fair, we win. But as we all know, the debate under our lock and key corporate media and cash laden politicians is seldom fair. The key to winning this fight, as is the case with many media fights, is increasing public involvement. The opposition knew what we know, in that they win by trying to ram through policy and locking it in before the public knows about it and would act to block or change it. Therefore, better public policy is directly correlated to more public involvement. The more public involvement and more public involvement is directly connected to more public awareness. That's a truism, I think, and it makes sense. You can't act about something unless you know that there's an issue, unless you know what it's about. And that's the motivation for these lectures, to provide another resource for folks to find out, to learn more, and to encourage people to act in ways large and small. It's how we've kept this fight going for more than a decade. It's how we'll win this fight and other fights to come. And public involvement in these fights have resonated far deeper than just asking the FCC to establish Title II classification for internet connections, though that is quite important. We are presently in the middle of an opportunity that comes maybe once a generation, a critical juncture in which the opportunities for social change are far greater and faster than those in ordinary times. How does that work? What can we do? What are the likely possibilities in the short term? And what are the deeper issues at play? These are all mighty, mighty and important questions, and we'll provide some measure of answers to them in the next and last lecture. Yay! What, how do you, I mean, that's a, I think that's a perfect hit piece on net neutrality. Um, you know, Washington Post, mm -hmm. you know. Um, have you read the article, uh, how do you feel about, how do we respond to people who may have, you know, pay attention to that and, you know, object to this idea of net neutrality as being a problem without you know, a solution? How do, how do we fight back, in other yeah. words? Um, it, the answer is lots of ways. Um, luckily, in the case of the Washington Post, and increasingly for a lot of newspapers that have an online component, every article has a comment section. That gets as read, if not more so, than a lot of the articles that they're commenting on. So at a minimum, yeah, go online, find the article, and if you think it's full of crap, say so. And explain it in as circulate, articulate terms as you can. Stories help. You can come up with stories to do that. More widely, yeah, it, it's the, in the crafting of opposition to this, I found, and what a lot of people recommend as a particularly useful tactic, is trying to make things less abstract and more concrete. What are the specific ways in which the internet has improved your life? And how would a violation of net neutrality detract from that? You can answer those questions or provide examples of ways in which it's helped you or others. Tell those stories and share those stories. And yeah, they hold a great resonance. In the case of policy decisions at the FCC, and we've seen this especially regarding the low power FM fight. This was a particular genius thing that low power FM radio advocates and organizers used. They mentioned the examples of how their specific policy succeeded. They asked people to tell their stories, to make it away from the abstract issues into a more concrete selection. How did having a radio station help you when you needed help? How did it benefit you? How was it a positive thing? Knowing that and having those stories and telling those stories and getting them on the record, which is a lot of times now gotten a lot easier. You can go to FCC.gov slash comments. They've provided a handy list. They list not only the, tick, the docket of what it is and it's proceeding, but a helpful link that will take you to the exact form. Fill out that form 
or ask people to fill out that form, push a button, and voila. Do note that whatever comments you say become part of the public record and are searchable by everyone. That's a good thing. So if you've got something you want to share and are comfortable in doing so, you can do so. Just remember that that's going to be public. So hide any details you want hidden. But for details you don't want hidden and want public, that's the way to do it. And that's how I think would be the solution here. Get more stories of how this benefits out there in any and every way you can and can think of. Yes. How long is that comment period open right now? How long is the comment period open uh, right now? Um, I actually mentioned this in the next lecture, but to answer it quickly, um, the comment window all told is about four months long. The docket opened May 15th. The initial round, the way it works is there is both an initial round and then a reply round where people can make comments and then people can respond to those initial comments. So the first round runs two months from May 15th through July 15th, 2014. Once those replies are in, then you have a, 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 once those initial posts are in, then you have a reply round that runs from July 15th to September 15th, another two months. So the full docket all told is four months. As a practical matter though, um, technically you could still reply in um, later and it'll still hold weight. Probably not as much weight as it does during the beginning part um, because they're considered that's where you have the initial responses. That's where you have your say on things. But I saw this especially in the media ownership fight of 2003. They were getting flood of comments right up to the very end of the vote regarding their media ownership fight. They, they ignored almost all of it. But, but the record was, but nonetheless, the record was clear. And the record was the reason why the lawsuit that blocked the FCC succeeded. And we'll talk about that as well. The, courts, the, the, the court that overturned the FCC they overturned the FCC said a million people actually more than that but a million people commented on this doesn't that matter and the court acknowledged yes it does or it should and that's why they blocked it take away those three million votes and that would have failed but how did three million people hear about it I'm getting a little ahead of things but we'll talk about that in the lecture well the short answer is because we made it an issue and people heard about it as a result of the efforts that I and others did Welcome to Omega. This is the fourth of four lectures on net neutrality. And we covered a lot in these lectures. We refer, re reviewed the definition and details of net neutrality. We reviewed the definition of the term, why it's necessary, and what's at stake in the fight. We've looked at the history of net neutrality in policy, in law, in the courts, and in the court of public opinion. We've now come to today, the summer of 2014. On May 15, 2014, as was mentioned before in previous lectures, the FCC approved the docket. This will mark the third time that the FCC will attempt to craft policy on net neutrality provisions with the previous two times defeated in court. In a significant development, the FCC has included Title II classification, the formal policy involving public service, common carriage, and non-discrimination among the policy options included in the notice for proposed rulemaking. This development is a credit to what is arguably the largest number of comments, an estimated 3.4 million so far, who commented on the FCC on net neutrality in what appears to be the most of any single issue in the agency's history. The FCC will accept initial comments on the docket until July 15, 2014. From July 14, 15, 2014 through September 15, 2014, the FCC will accept replies to those initial comments. You can comment through the FCC's website at www.fcc.gov slash comments or use the handy online forms available at www.savetheinternet.com, one of the coalitions that has been working on net neutrality in recent years and in the past. If you do nothing else on this matter, I strongly encourage you to comment and ask, demand, the FCC reclassified the internet as a Title II telecommunications service. I would like to address a point now regarding all this activism and the futility that might be perceived around it. A lot of non-activists, and even a number of activists who disdain getting involved in matters of policy, will understandably scoff at getting involved in matters of trying to influence, influence government policy. There is reason to be cynical. 
The FCC, as the record long shows, is more a handmaiden of corporate power than an advocate of the public interest, convenience, and necessity. Officials at the FCC, far more often than not, use the FCC as a stepping stone to positions within the corporate media and aligned industries, positions that are much higher paid and with far less critical scrutiny or awareness. But we have also seen that corporate power can be defeated. Recall the media ownership fight of 2003. The comments that were submitted to that docket, both in their quantity and their quality, were exactly the reason why the lawsuit that overturned the media ownership rule demolition that the FCC tried was successful. Andy Schwartzman, an attorney who argued that suit in 2003, recalled the comment by the judges at the time that a million people, in quotes, wound up actually being more like three million people, but a million people commented on the docket in some way, and that that flood of commentary should matter, and that therefore we, they, block the FCC rule rewrite, which they would have otherwise seen billions of dollars of sweeping mergers and acquisitions across our entire media landscape in just a few months. But ask yourself, how did millions of people know about the docket to comment on it, where before the major media who sought to cash in on the rewrite were effectively mute on the matter in the run-up to the FCC's vote? In sum, it was because of growing activist efforts in communities across America who saw what was coming and who raised the alarm in every way that they, we, could. Predictions be damned. Those activists also caught a number of lucky breaks along the way, and the FCC's short-lived policy victory wound up being a Pyrrhic victory and ultimately into a full-fledged defeat. We could see something similar on the FCC's docket on net neutrality. The numbers are certainly there for a populist-fueled victory, with possibly more numbers to come. And there are promises of a lawsuit, regardless how the ruling slants. The problem for net neutrality advocates is that, as we've seen, using the courts to defend net neutrality without a reclassification of the internet are probably not going to work. But fortunately, that's now abundantly clear. What's more, Given the threat that a reclassification would have regarding certain public services, for example, the use of voice over IP telephone for 911 emergency calls, as is increasingly the case, it becomes all the more necessary to reclassify the internet to prevent the kind of degrading service for profit that net neutrality advocates fear might happen. This is why some analysts think that the FCC eventually will come around to reclassifying the internet back into a Title II framework. But predictions about the fate of net neutrality aside, we should not rest on our laurels, regardless how the net neutrality wars of 2014 turn out. The reason is that there are deeper issues at play that also tie into net neutrality, and I'd like to devote the remainder of this lecture to addressing some of those issues. In brief, I'd like to address the reactive nature of political activism, the role and fate of markets in the net neutrality fight and in society more generally, and the critical juncture, the rare opportunity that we face in our current time. As we've seen, the fight over net neutrality has been punctuated by intense times of great activity, like the fight over the COPE Act of 2006 and the net neutrality wars of 2014. But my point here is that such activism is less about being active and more about being reactive. It seems that we're always fighting to stop something, usually policies that are driven by corporate diktat. Seldom are we setting the timetable or, heaven forbid, setting the agenda. Please note, what I'm about to discuss gets us somewhat removed from the discussion of net neutrality, but the matters are clearly connected. Corporations that have a stranglehold on our political process and the possible fate of net neutrality and by extension of the internet and the future of our communications, and for that matter, most everything on earth, is critical. Just ask any environmental activist, ask most any activist, the aim of a corporation that's faithful to its charter is continual growth at the expense of everything else, even if, especially if, it leaves destruction, sometimes death, in its wake, just like a cancer. But actual physical cancers include at least some potential concern for the cause of that cancer, the carcinogen. Continuing with this metaphor for a moment, if a corporation is a cancer, what is the carcinogen? There are clearly a number of factors that are playing that cement the prized position of corporations in our day and age, certainly in the United States. The Corporation, a documentary film and namesake book by Joel Bakken, 
delves into some of the history on this. But there is one potential carcinogen, a major factor affecting the oversized influence of corporations and impacting the fate of net neutrality and much else, whose criticism is as big a taboo as any in our day and age. I'm talking about markets. Markets, the main allocation mechanism of our economy and of the world economy, where buyers and sellers compete against each other, as do buyers against other buyers and sellers against other sellers, with prices serving as a mark of bargaining power. It is regarded as an article of faith, practically, that all this competition engendered by markets is a good thing, that the proverbial invisible hand will guide good results out of these competitive interactions. And yet, the candle lit by market faith is blown out by the evidence. We see that across industries, across sectors of the economy, markets concentrate. Over time, fewer and fewer producers hold more and more control. And given the market dynamics at play, that makes sense. In an economy where you either eat or be eaten, it makes sense to be a monster. And a corporation is the political economic equivalent of a monster. If criticizing markets for good reason is taboo, then so is calling for the abolition of markets and their replacement with a more participatory economy that won't result in these corporate monsters holding disp disproportionate sway over the internet and over our lives and over the planet. Yes, we should call for, we should demand that the FCC reclassify the internet as a Title II telecommunication service. But should we win the net neutrality wars of 2014? That won't stop the looming threat of corporations hovering over everything, constantly reacting to everything ready to roll back our hard-fought wins. We need to stop playing defense, constantly reacting to everything that corporations do. We need to start playing on offense by calling for a better economy that would make these life-threatening and net neutrality-threatening corporations shrivel and die. Getting into the details of what that kind of economy would work, would look like, should work, would require probably at least another four lectures. But for the time being, I would recommend two books for people interested in exploring this topic. One, the book Of the People, By the People, The Case for a Participatory Economy by Robin Hanel. Two, the book Real Utopia, Participatory Society for the 21st Century, edited by Chris Spanos, which I should say in the interest of disclosure, I helped to contribute a chapter to. I'll admit that this proposal, abolishing the markets that spawn corporations in order to help preserve net neutrality, might seem to some people a bit extreme, maybe even unrealistic, to which I would say, yes, of course it's extreme and unrealistic. Realism in this context is just another word for cynicism. Many of the wins of social justice in contemporary times were deemed in advance to be unrealistic. Ripping the veneer of legitimacy off our financial system in 2011 with a ragtag effort called Occupy Wall Street was unrealistic. Stopping the FCC's media ownership rule demolition in 2003 with an unparalleled mass uprising was unrealistic. Stopping the World Trade Organization's Seattle Round in 1999 with massive and concerted street protests was unrealistic. The list can go on. In fact, I dare say now that I dare say that now is the time, more than ever, to pose the most unrealistic proposals you can think of. There's a reason why. Social change doesn't always happen in a linear fashion. Sometimes it can get very dramatic and very deep and very fast. These opportunities for deep social change have to do with what are called critical junctures. These are once a generation opportunities for deep, dramatic, and quick social change. But these opportunities don't last very long, perhaps a decade or two. I'll quote, a length, I'll quote at length from a book that discusses the idea in detail. Communications Revolution, Critical Junctures and the Future of Media by Robert McChesney. McChesney writes, quote, The decisions made during such a critical juncture establish institutions and rules that likely put us on a course that will be difficult to change in any fundamental sense for decades or generations. When it comes to the history of telecommunications technology, McChesney further writes that critical junctures in media and communications tend to occur when at least two, if not all three, of the following conditions hold. One, there is a revolutionary new communications technology that undermines the existing system. Two, the content of the media system, especially the journalism, is increasingly discredited or seen as illegitimate. And three, 
There is a major political crisis, severe social disequilibrium, in which the existing order is no longer working, and there are major movements for social reform. In the past century, McChesney continues, critical junctures in media and journalism occurred three times. In the progressive era, when the journalism was in deep crisis and, overall, and the overall political system was in turmoil around the year 1900. In the 1930s, when the emergence of radio broadcasting combined with public antipathy to commercialism against the backdrop of the Depression. And in the 1960s and 70s, when popular social movements in the United States provoked radical critiques of the media as part of a broader social and political, political critique. I believe that we are in another critical juncture now. Two of the circumstances are undeniably in place. One, a revolutionary new communications technology that undermines the existing system. The internet. Check. Two, the content of the media system, especially the journalism, is increasingly discredited or seen as illegitimate. America's journalism was asleep at the switch on the 2003 invasion of Iraq, the Great Recession of 2008, the great NSA privacy invasion, among many, many other stories, while our extant newspapers are collapsing and journalists are getting laid off in droves. Check. Is there a major political crisis, part of the third criterion for a critical juncture? Is there severe social equilibrium in which the existing order is no longer working? Same part of that third criterion. Again, these are debatable points. What's the threshold for severe social disequilibrium? But it is clear that things are and have been out of whack. I just mentioned some examples of this. Are there major movements for social reform? Again, a debatable point. When does something qualify as a major movement? But things do trend in this direction, without a doubt. Despite the suppression of the Occupy Wall Street movement, many of those active in the Occupy movement are still active on various initiatives, even if those, even if those efforts are not widely known. Those efforts are coupled by growing and active efforts on, you name it, immigrant rights, economic justice and living wage efforts, the environment, particularly the climate crisis, LGBT rights, justice along gender lines, media reform, media justice, the list goes on. So it seems we've come close if we're not already at our trifecta, our hat trick, our triple crown, the three circumstances that are emblematic of a critical juncture. So is that it? Will positive societal change now simply play itself out, with net neutrality being one of those changes? I'm inclined to say, not quite. While there's coordinated efforts, while there's a lot of motion on various fronts, no denying that, there's little in the way of coordinated efforts towards some grand unifying end. These efforts, all of them, need to, some center of gravity around which to rotate, to crystallize, to coalesce. Again, Robert McChesney, along with co-author John Nichols, make this point in a book called Dollarocracy. McChesney and Nichols write in Dollarocracy, quote, There is more than sufficient demand for reform, and there are more than sufficient reforms under consideration. But to our view, there is an insufficiency of focus. There needs to be a unifying theme that will galvanize the movement and enhance its power. From this enhanced power, and only from such enhanced power, can foundational democratic reforms emerge? This is the last great challenge in shaping the current movement for reform into a necessary transformational politics." End quote. McChesney and Nichols suggest as their unifying theme the act of voting that has animated so much political activism throughout American history. I myself have offered a second potential theme, the abolition of markets and their replacement with a more participatory economy. Doing that, I surmise, would decapitate the corporations that threaten net neutrality and much else besides. No doubt others can and have offer other themes, to which I say, please do, and let the debate begin. The sooner we can argue through these potential unifying themes during this rare opportunity, this critical juncture, the sooner we can coalesce around one, the sooner we can enhance our growing power, the sooner we can change the world for the better and help net neutrality along the way. In the short term, again, I encourage you to contact the FCC. So ask, demand, that they reclassify the Internet as a Title II telecommunication service. Once again, you can add your comment to the official docket through the FCC's website at FCC.com.